Welcome to Conversations with Tom Shorkey. Conversations explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live through the eyes of interesting individuals. Now let's join our host, Tom Shorkey. Welcome to Conversations. I'm your host for today's program, Tom Shorkey. And with me today is a very recognizable figure throughout the Blue Water area from Port Huron, St. Clair, and Marine City. I'd like to welcome today's guest on Conversations, Tony Cavus. Thank you, Tom. It's nice to be here. I, uh, I'm Tony, honored. Well, I, and we're very glad you took time uh, to come in and meet with us. There's so much we could cover uh, about the Blue Water area and the different roles that you played in it. But for our listening audience, some of you, some of our audience know you as the kid that grew up in Port Huron. Some people know you as the St. Clair resident that was very involved in Theater Guild. And at the south end of the East China School District, they all remember Mr. Cavus from the English department. But let's go back a little <laughs> bit. You grew up in Port Huron. Growing up in the 50s in Port Huron, early 60s, Give me a little bit of that. What part of town and, and well, what are your remembrances? We grew, I grew up in the central part of town on Erie Street, very close to the community college now, Erie and Glenwood. The house is still there. Uh, I went to, uh, let's think, my first eight years of school just down the street. My whole life revolved around that area. In fact, my parents always lived within five blocks of there. so. Everyone they knew, everyone I knew, was there, including the police, actually, yeah. <laughs> which uh, could have, was a problem at times when I was older. But uh, it, w it was a, a great time to grow up. You know, everybody says, oh, remember what it was like back then? Well, it was really like that. I mean, we were out on the streets till dark, and we didn't have cars unless we were awfully lucky. You know, if we could borrow the folks' car, we walked. And... But everything was there. Right? Port Huron had a downtown. We had movie theaters, and it was just a fun place to be. When you said you went to school a couple blocks away, that must have meant St. Stephen's back in the good old it, days. It was St. Stephen's, and, and that's kind of an unusual thing because my father's Greek Orthodox, and my mother was Roman Catholic, and my father insisted that we go to the Catholic school. And he was a very close friends with Monsignor McCormick, who uh, ran the parish. And so that made things a little iffy at times as well. But he was a real big believer in education, and especially in private education uh, at the time. Well, and back in the 50s and early 60s, which, uh, you know, some of our private schools or Catholic schools still exist today, but not with the vibrancy that they had back in the 50s and 60s. Now, you, there was St. Stephen's, and if I remember, was there a St. Joseph also at that time? There was. It was actually right down the street. Uh, the 7th Street Bridge, if you crossed, uh, Erie turned into 7th, and you went six blocks, and there was St. Joseph's School. And it was just really the river divided which parish school uh, you attended. And uh, I remember my cousins lived a few blocks from me, and they moved to the other side of the river, but they still remain St. Stephen's kids. And, uh, <laughs> well, and you know, it's interesting. St. Stephen's had wonderful reputation for uh, academics and athletics back at that time, and uh, even uh, for being the, the Catholic school in the St. Clair area league with Marysville, St. Clair, Marine City, Algonac, they were formidable uh, opponents in almost every sport. But about the time you were getting ready for high school, there was something new afoot in Port Huron. Explain to our listeners what the heck was happening back in the early 60s in education at that time. Well, it, it, the, uh, the priests from eight different parishes had decided they would like to have something bigger and better with more to offer. And uh, basically it was called an idea a dream and a reality, and what the uh, realism was, Port Huron Catholic High School. And there was a drive throughout the entire community, and oh, prominent members of the community raising funds to build this new school, which would be way out in the country, which mm -hmm. <laughs> isn't that far out now, but at the time it was, because everything was downtown. And 
Everybody thought it would be called Catholic Central, and people still to this day call it that. And I remember my cousin saying, oh, I'll be moving out there with you. And she was two years ahead of me. And they just mm. thought they would pick up St. Stephen's and they would go. And the concept was, no, this starts anew and everything is different. And Port Huron Catholic came to being. I was lucky. I was in the first class. Boys had a class. Girls had a class. That was new. Girls wore uniforms. That was new. Boys always wore ties, but now we had to wear jackets or cardigan sweaters. That was new. I didn't seem too much. So you went out there as a freshman. Are you right. saying that that was all that there was at that, that time? That was it. Freshman? That was and it. And if you were in the 10th, 11th, or 12th grade, you were still at St. Stephen's because they were, they you know, were phased that out over time. They phased it out as we phased in. So basically, my class, we were seniors for four years, and we thought... We thought we were top dog, you know, there. And uh, so all, all the kids below us, they, they all knew us because we were there. We knew what it was like. We started a semester at St. Stephen's, and then we moved out to a partially completed new school. St. Stephen's had one order of nuns who taught the IHMs. We had four orders and priests. Unheard of, you know, but they were specialties in their field. Math and science, uh, we had one group. Literature and the arts, we had another group. And that, that was the whole idea, to really boost the, the academics. It was fairly strict. Well, I, <laughs> would I would imagine it was. But we need to do a little geography lesson for our All listeners right. because if uh, you are new to our area, and I would say the last 40 years or so, uh, we're talking about some strange territory. First of all, the Newport Year and Catholic they were developing out in the country is really on 32nd Street and is now the present Port Huron Central Middle School. Is that correct? That's correct. Right by Menards. Right. So. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, oh, in the shadow of Menards. Now, the thing that people may not realize, we talk about St. Stephen's and you walked uh, every place in Port Huron. Right. Explain where St. Stephen's church and school were located in Port Huron. St. Stephen's Church and School were located on Erie Street, Erie and Bard, which is now uh, <coughs> Bard, excuse me, Broad, excuse me, which is now McMorrin. And if you go down Erie Street, that is where the community college campus is. And the St. Stephen's School is still there. I believe it's called the North Building. And it's actually been part of a controversy lately, the gymnasium, which was built. Well, my brother played the first basketball game there. So I know when it was built. And uh, I think he played it in like 49. Anyway, they are the ones, uh, the college have recently acquired part of McMorrin so they can have kind of a field house effect. But that's where it is. The building is still standing and it's in pretty good shape and it's where the Port Huron uh, uh, Athletic Hall of Fame is, is located in that building. That's where they moved it. Oh, really? Now, and just to recap quickly, if you're in Port Huron and you are going to an event at McMorrin, on one corner is McMorrin Auditorium, Kitty Corner across the street is the administration building of the community college, on the southeast corner is a parking lot, and St. Stephen's Church sat Kitty Corner from that on the northwest corner of what would that be? Erie right. and McMorrin, I guess it would be. Right, now. it's where the uh, library science, Clara E. McKenzie Library Science Building, I believe now is, and that was the church, the rectory, behind was where the nuns were, and then there was this unusual we, building. What we'd really like to do is get into the archives and see what those nuns really <laughs> said about little Tony Cavus. But let, there was an interesting event uh, in the area within the past year that had something to do with the old poor here in Catholic. Poor Young Catholic really existed for what, seven or eight years before it? There were seven graduating classes, yes. And uh, last summer, <clears throat> not to age us, Tom, but it was uh, our 50, my 50th class reunion. And I always have fun planning those. As a matter of fact, we always say the planning meetings are more fun than the reunion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're just sitting around talking, and I said, I wonder what's in that cornerstone at the school. And people are looking saying, what cornerstone? What are you talking about? And I says, well, we should look into it. You know, Port Huron School District owns the building now. We should look into it. Well, 
nobody wanted to do it. And uh, a year ago, actually, uh, I was up uh, reading to my daughter, who's a teacher at Krull Elementary, read, not reading to her, reading to her class, and I thought, there's the central office, there's the super's office. So I went over to inquire and I told them, you know, uh, our class would really be interested in knowing what's in that cornerstone, could we talk about it? So discussions went on and we found uh, a mason who would do all the work for free to open it and Port Huron schools really promoted it. And we had a couple of the local TV stations there and the Times Herald and came the day. I had about, oh, I don't know, close to 40 of my classmates uh, were in, from the area. They came just for that. Anything Anxious. interesting in that cornerstone? Well, they said, uh, Mr. Kavis, would you please come up and open it? And I kind of went, oh, I don't know if I want to open it. And I kinda, that <laughs> might be the report card we've been looking for. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well, there were a lot of rumors what was in there, but there were no hinges and this copper thing kind of creaked. And there were just papers in there. All of our names were there. And then all of the papers describing the whole planning process for that school were in there. All these you know, handouts they would, would send to the parishioners. And so they were really fun to read. And there were religious medals and things. It's all spread out for quite a while. And we've got pictures of it. And it just made for uh, just a really neat experience. 50 years later. Going back to the school you walk through, and I think when you're 14, 15, 16, you think the place is mammoth. Did the place look any different to you and your classmates going back after 50 years? Well, you know, I tried to walk in the doorway, always did, but that was, no, you enter from a different door. So I walked down, enter from the different door. First thing I see is a sign that says, walk to the right, do not run, yeah. <laughs> and things I thought, walk to the right. That's what we had to do, and I went in the hall, and I looked, I thought, this looks the same, and I kind of peeked around the corner, pristine. They've kept this place beautiful. And uh, when I met that day with the principal, of course, it was in her office, which brought back some fond memories. And uh, uh, very minor changes uh, that were made. Uh, some of the boys' bathrooms had to be made into girls' bathrooms because we had a boys' wing and a girls' wing. And at lunch, there were tables of four, two boys and two girls. Not the same two boys and two girls every day, mm -hmm. unless you were sneaky seniors like we were, and uh, I ate with the same guy and the same two girls almost every day. And <laughs> So if you went in there as a freshman, then the class of 65, I think it was, that was the first graduating class from we were. Korean Catholic. We, we were. And, and interesting enough, sidebar on that is the class of 64 at St. Stephen's, was probably about 45 kids, the last. The last one. The la they were seniors all by themselves in that old building. Yeah, and, and, and the building, and uh, they had well, just a little bit of time when, you know, the college bought the property. The very for, next year. I yeah, and for, I mean, when I was my freshman year at Port Huron Junior College, I was back at old St. Stephen's taking classes again. And, well, let me ask you this, Tony. You can't have the name Tony Cavas, and be from poor here in the area <laughs> without everybody wondering if you're the guy that owns all the Cavas restaurants. So give us a little background on your dad. Um, came from Greece, how did all that work, and how did he land in Port Huron? Well, he came from Greece as a boy. Uh, you know, everything is questionable as to what year it was, but he was probably 14 or 15, and his brother sponsored him. And he lived in Detroit for a while, and Chicago and his brother died and he was you know just kind of shuffled around the Greek community really with nowhere to go but he knew he had a cousin in Port Huron uh, who happened to be Jim Janis who recently bought the Coney Island and anyway they communicated and my father came to Port Huron to work for his cousin uh, the families when were, would that have been like in the 30s or at that time yeah when, when did oh no he would have been in his 20s <clears throat> he was like no, 15. but I mean, what year? I mean, are would we he have come to Port Huron in the twenties? In the twenties? Yes, in the twenties, because he and my mother were married. I don't know, thirty-one, thirty-two, something like that. In uh, the Janus family, was had Coney Islands, like it seems like forever. And the yeah, Cavuses well, were from the same village in Greece. They, that they were next door neighbors, actually. And actually, Jim's brother, George Janus, and my father, they came over together on the same boat, and. Uh, you know, my father went with his brother, and Jim 
sent his brother uh, to college, and George became a dentist, and uh, Dr. Janice, and uh, he didn't go in the restaurant business. Smart. George. So where you lived, you walked three or four blocks of school, if that, and your dad had a couple of different restaurants in, in the where, right. where, my where father, do you remember the family business being? The, the business was always downtown. My father always walked. Uh, he was a terrible driver, so he didn't drive. I think I was in the car with him once. <laughs> he disregarded stop signs, so he walked everywhere. Uh, downtown, his first restaurant on his own was the, uh, was the TNG Grill, and there might be you know, older uh, listeners who remember the TNG Grill, but they had car hops, they had a hamburger with lettuce, tomato, and mayo, and it was a huge, huge success. And uh, he wanted to move on to make another success, and he uh, started the Unique Grill, which was across from McMoran Auditorium, where the present subway is. Okay. And uh, that was a restaurant he had while in my youth, uh, through uh, about eighth grade. And that was quite successful, too. And at that time was when he brought over my cousins, who are now the... Cabas restaurants, Tony and George. So we had two Tonys, three Georges, all living in the same house. And oh, everybody really? says, how, how do you do that? Well, we're named for our grandparents. And my grandfather was George, and my grandmother was Antonia. So that's how our names came about. Well, that Tony and George, they moved far away, around the corner. Yeah. And anyway, they... They were with my dad probably for close to 10 years, and then they started Cavus Grill, which is down on Quay Street today. And then again, they split, and there's Tony Cavus's, not mine, my cousin Tony, in Wadhams. Cavus Grill is downtown. My dad left, went to the north end at the time for Cavus's party store. And everybody says, wow. You must be rich. You own all these businesses. Well, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. And yes, I did have to work in the business. Wow, well, that was my next question. I, of course. And now you're a 1965 graduate of Port Huron Catholic, and it's time to go to college. What did you do? Don't tell me you walked three blocks down the street. Well, of course I did. Oh, okay. Because, I mean, that's where you go. <laughs> you, yeah. I mean, it's there. What's, what do you mean you want to go away to school? There's a college right there. There's nothing wrong with it. That's where you're going. Okay. You know, and that's where I, I went uh, for two years. I had a very good experience there. Uh, a lot of my classmates went there, but I developed new friends. And I became a class officer, student government officer. Uh, uh, gotten very involved with student life, which I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came time to transfer, I, I knew I wanted to go someplace where there was going to be a student life. And I had friends at Western Michigan. and. I'd already decided I wanted to go into education. Of course, it was known for as being a teacher's college, and that's where I went. And uh, When did you decide you were going to be a teacher? Interesting question. Uh, I always say it's when I was in fifth grade because my cousin Tony, uh, he married a very lovely young lady named Angie, and she couldn't speak a word of English. And she wasn't out in the everyday world like her husband. She was home with the baby, and she had the television. That's She could hear words. <laughs> And I used to go over every day because they too lived in the neighborhood. Everybody lived in the same neighborhood. And uh, I'd stop on my way home and try to talk to her. And we eventually be able, were able to communicate. Everybody says, well, then why don't you speak Greek? And uh, that's an interesting question, mainly because the people who spoke Greek were always at work. And my mother wasn't Greek. But yet, when my wife and I were in Greece for a month, I came home being fairly fluent in Greek and certainly could understand things, which mm -hmm. surprised a lot of people. But mm -hmm. over the years, it's really kind of slipped away. But, uh, and that's what my one regret is that I, I can't speak my father's language because uh, I, I think it would be important, you know. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> it it's be, a great story, though. It's a very interesting story about, well, then you're at Western. I'm you're at going Western. to be a teacher. You're going to get your first job somewhere in the world. Where did you really want to go to teach? Well, I wanted to stay in Kalamazoo because, I mean, everything was there. College life. I, I mean, I was only there two years. I, I you know, was a big shop fraternity man and, you know, yeah. did this and that. And I, I just, I, I loved it there. And I still do. Uh, my son lives near Kalamazoo. And uh, I love it over there. I always have. And uh, 
Well, there were no jobs there because everybody wanted to be there, of course. Oh, of course. And so you, you start looking all over the state. And uh, anyway, uh, I interviewed locally in Port Huron. And uh, that didn't look too good. And my, my aunt, my, my mother's twin sister, as a matter of fact, said, you know, I hear they're hiring teachers downriver. And I'm thinking, downriver? Where downriver? She says, Marine City. And I thought, Marine City? Well, you know, it's worth a shot, you know. And so I interviewed. and. I wasn't the only one who interviewed, and I was pretty much told, you know, uh, you're our first choice, but uh, you got to let us know right away. Well, I, it didn't take me long, and so I let them know right away, and I took the job. And, and if you didn't, you'd be back washing dishes. Yeah, exactly. Some, oh, my God. I'd be back at the Coney Island yeah. with everybody yelling, Tony, Tony, Bonds, yeah. Bonds. Yeah. <laughs> I stayed at Marine City 33 years. Wow. Uh, I never planned on that. I was uh, 32 years in the same room. Whoa. And everybody says, well, why did you leave? You were fairly young. And I says, well, here's the reason. Very simple. They had decided to add on to my end of the school, two rooms on my side, two rooms across the hall. I wasn't going to be the first room, and they were going to renumber it. And it wasn't going to be room 14 anymore. I and I said, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. But that, that's really no. not it. No, I know that's not <laughs> And you know what? Uh, anybody that graduated uh, probably Marine City High School, almost throughout your entire tenure, you got to know those seniors very up close and personal because I think you and Penny Berman, for the most part, were the senior class sponsors for, like, how many years did you I, You know, I, I, I was trying to remember that, but Penny was longer than I was, but I was probably a good 12 to 15 years, and they used to switch. And you take a class from ninth grade to twelfth grade, then there'd be other teachers. But for some reason, when Penny and I became junior sponsors, we became senior, and then we stayed as senior sponsors. And Penny and I were very different people, but we clicked as far as what should be done, and we we knew the job, and uh, we did that. I had the yearbook, also she had the cheerleaders, you know, and, and we had all these things going. And yes, we did know an awful lot of the students. They actually, they knew us. We didn't always know them. And funny thing, you should mention that. Every once in a while, I'll make a comment on Facebook, and then there'll be this person who'll say, oh, Mr. Gavis, how are you? Got one two days ago from someone. Mr. Gavis, how are you? It's nice to see you still around. And I, says, <laughs> I just reply and says, ah, it's nice to be around. Yeah. you know. And, and I can't put a high school face on this guy. Mm -hmm. Looked at his pictures, and I'm going, got the name. Mm -hmm. Can't picture him, but you know. The, the other, there's one more funny thing about Mr. Cavus. He's at the Junction Buoy in, in Marysville with my sons, who are also both teachers. All of a sudden we hear, hi, Mr. Cavus. <laughs> and they, they looked at me and they said, must be yours, Dad. We don't <laughs> teach around here. Wrong. It was my son Andrew's student <laughs> who happened to be there with his parents. But uh, uh, my wife was a teacher. It, it's amazing. Uh, our three kids are all teachers. Why did you let them do that? I didn't let them do anything. You know, it's what they chose. And uh, I'm from a, my father was a poor goat herder, you know. Yeah. I'm the first one to have a college education in my family. And uh, I'll tell you, to see George Cavus's face that day in, in Kalamazoo was priceless. Uh, because my brother and sister, they started, they didn't finish. Nobody, it's something he never did himself. Mm -hmm. And he made me feel uh, terrific. And uh, I, I never forgot that. Well, let me go one more on good old Marine City High before we move on. And in my life and in my career, I have seen graduations in many schools and, and many different school districts. Mm -hmm. But I really believe the way that the Marine City High School, I mean, people would say that the way Marine City High School's graduation were conducted, and did we call them? Hoop girls or flower. We call them the hoop girls, right? Where a certain number of juniors would be selected to hold the flowered flowers. arches for the scene. There were arches of flowers. And it, uh, it's interesting because uh, my kids went to St. Clair High. And the ceremony is it's very nice and it's handled very well. And uh, but it's not the same. Marine City's stayed in the gym, small town. The girls, as far as I know, even though a couple of principals want to do away with it, still make the hoops of flowers, uh, and the, the graduates parade through them, and uh, 
you know, it's a little different. I think they buy them now. I, the, the old tale was they would be uh, stealing them from the neighbor's gardens, <laughs> but uh, it, and it was an honor for a junior girl to do that. And uh, for some uh, later, when we were faculty, the faculty sat on the stage mm -hmm. we didn't used to, and to sit up there and watch those seniors walk through their faces. It, I, there's no way to describe it, and it, it, it's a beautiful ceremony down there. And people come to that ceremony who have nothing to do with it, just yeah. because. And it's it nice. Is. It it's is. Yeah, nice I mean, day. it's special, and and uh, and a lot of credit, um, well deserved, is both to that tradition that you and Penny were a, a big part of uh, establishing well, there and continuing. And it didn't matter if it was 1976 or 1992. I think, uh, not the parents so much, but the principals and teachers' concerns always were, how are these kids going to behave during graduation? And it always <laughs> went off flawlessly. So well, we, we, you, uh, you know, there's, we, a, there's a lot of funny stories even when you were principal yeah. there, but you know, they had to be at rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rehearsal was always the day after their honors convocation. And the kids, uh, they were already out celebrating. And there were some who weren't there. And rehearsal for commencement did not start till everyone was there. Mm -hmm. And there were people from uh, in authority sent to get certain individuals who came in rather pale and they sat through it and their classmates you know, glared at them because they had to stay longer for this stupid rehearsal. But yeah, there was little tricks you learned along yeah, the way. Yeah, but there. we you know we went through it so you know we, we we explained to them and most of them had been to it and they knew what it would be like With and the decor so they didn't mess around. No, not at all. All right, we have to switch gears, Mr. Cavus, <laughs> or we're going to have a, uh, a uh, mini-series on our hands. Yeah, really? Let's talk St. Clair Theater Guild. Uh, it's been a big part of your adult life. Um, you've had a number of roles in leadership there with right. being president. And Just give us a little background on Theater Guild, and I've got a couple of questions for you. Well, well ver very quickly, when I first came to Marine City, as I said, uh, I really missed college and life and because of activities. And uh, we had a, a librarian at Marine City who was uh, going to be in charge of props for a Sinclair Theater Guild show. And she wanted some helpers. And so myself and Chuck Homburg both said, hey, we'll go up there. And I'm backstage there, and I'm helping, and not only moving props, but sets around and looking at what's going on. I'm thinking, well, I could do that, mm -hmm. you know. And the next thing I know, in the fall, I auditioned and I got a part in the show. And uh, I, I used to sing. I, I, I sang for Sister Gloria Kokornan, who's still in charge of singing at St. Joseph's. Sang in a fraternity singing college, but never did anything with it. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, I'm getting parts and things and meeting friends and finally meeting people you know, rather than just the people they teach with. And uh, so I was enjoying it as uh, a social activity. Everybody says, well, why don't you do the plays at Marine City? And I said, no, I don't want to do that. This is my time. I mean, your time might be bowling. This is for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, How many different roles do you think you played over the years? Oh, my years? God. I have no idea. Uh, I had several lead roles in shows. I had... <laughs> I think my wife Janelle says her favorite thing was with uh, my good friend who's passed away, Russell Calaclio. We had 11 different roles in one show, and we were on and off, on and off, changing our clothes. And everybody, she says, part of the, the show that made it so funny was who would we be next? And yeah. uh, it was a lot of fun. And and I, I, I always said I, I like being in the chorus because you didn't have to learn lines. You know, mm -hmm. you just had to go and sing and show up on stage and. Uh, so I did a lot of those. Then I took over from a friend of mine and ended up running the cabaret. And uh, oh my God, I did that. Did that for 20 years, and we decided to hang. That was a fundraiser for the Theater Guild. For the Theater Guild scholarship, which oh. I am still involved with. Uh, that's the one thing I still am involved with with the Theater Guild. I'm scholarship chairperson for that. What was your What was your most favorite role that you played in a theater guild production? That, that, that's a toughie. I, it's kind of a cross, probably between two things. One, where I had the lead in do patent leather shoes for the reflect up because it was really me. Yeah. And everybody said, that was easy. That was you, a Catholic kid growing up. So yeah. that was fun. And I, 
I had a lot of songs to learn, but it was enjoyable. Uh, that was a lot of work. And my five-year-old son, Andrew, <laughs> I drive him to soccer practice, and he could read, and he's going over the lines in the cars. It, it was fun. But I think my, the one that was the most fun on stage was when I played the Hayseed against Judy Avison in uh, my song was Kansas City in the musical Oklahoma. We had more fun and laughter in that show, and uh, we became. Was, was she the nun in the patent leather shoes? She was the nun I, in patent she leather was, shoes. She yes. reminded me of some nun. Yeah, she, she certainly did. And uh, we've remained friends since we were at their uh, their place uh, on Dauphin Island, uh, Georgia. In fact, a picture just popped up uh, where they were about three years ago. They don't live in St. Clair anymore, but those are some of my favorite me memories. But of course, it's got to be <laughs> one of my favorite ones involves you. Oh, no. <laughs> you were the villain. Oh, my yes. wife was the heroine. She, we weren't married yet. And I was the hero. And I stole her away from the villain. And I proposed to her on stage, and we were already engaged. And that was it. We didn't appear on stage again for 25 years, and then we were again, Janelle and I. And uh, Well, for our listening audience, <laughs> I want them to know that Tony Gavis talked to me into auditioning one time, and I remember it, Fleetwood Dashaway, and... I don't even remember my and, name. And Janelle was the fair maiden that you oh, rescued yes, from was. the guy with the mustache. But, okay, we'll now move on from Peter <laughs> Guild after that. Yeah. Who's influenced you in your life? And there's a, a well, couple know, I, of people that have really made a difference for Tony Cavus over the years. Obviously, it was my father. Um, to look and see what he did with the, he came from nothing, and he raised a family successfully, and he always uh, he was always happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I gave a testimonial at his funeral and. I made my one cousin cry, but it was, it, it, it's, you know, what he said to me, and he, uh, getting me ready to go away to college, you know, and there's my dad, you know, my dad was a very thrifty man, he says, you've got to have a good suit, you've got to have this, you've got to have that, I says, okay, I says, I don't have money to buy all that stuff, he says, a gentleman has that, he says, remember, Tony, always be a gentleman, and don't ever forget it. Uh, my father was the, the true gentleman, and I've always tried to live up to his code. I mean, I'll tell you, there he'd be in his white shirt and tie, and he'd be carving the turkey up. And my mother would be yelling at him, George, you're going to get that tie ruined. And, then, yeah. you know, and, and it, 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 was just, it, it, it was just great. He loved my wife uh, tremendously, uh, which made me happy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, when I went to Greece the first time as a single guy with my buddies, um, my uncle, his brother was, oh my God, he was a character. And he wanted me to take home a bride. And I says, I'm here with my friends. He says, oh, <laughs> they take one too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so anyway, we left. We didn't take home a bride. But when I brought my Nifi, which is bride, yeah. to the village, and when she crossed arms with him to take his homemade wine, oh man, <laughs> she made a friend for life, you know. And uh, that uh, my dad was just—he uh, was cool. the best. I mean, there was there's no doubt about it. I, yeah, there there couldn't be a better. Uh, yeah, you know, he he was just. Uh, One more thing, Tony, you you uh, and Janelle raised uh, your family in Saint Clair. Why Saint Clair? Of all the places, well, you know, a little bit about. It was funny Why you because St. Clair and what it's meant to you. When we were first married, we lived in Marine City. We had an apartment there, and uh, we didn't want to stay in the apartment long. We wanted to get a house, so we we just started looking, and we looked in both cities. And uh, actually, we didn't buy the house we really wanted, but we couldn't get it. And uh, we talked and we talked and we talked, and uh, I says, you know, for me personally, I would prefer being a high school teacher in the other town. And she understood mm -hmm. that. Now she was an elementary media specialist, and so she was in all of them. But little kids are different. And several of my friends had kids, they taught there and their kids yeah. went to Marine City. But I just wasn't real comfortable with that. And so 
<laughs> we still live in the same house several editions later, and uh, I never planned to stay here, but after we got married and bought that house, we knew this area, not just the city of St. Clair, East China Schools, the whole bit, that was where we wanted to raise our family because we just knew it would be a great place to bring up our children. We have not one complaint about them going through East China Schools. Uh, all three of them were extremely successful. Uh, we're very proud of them. Uh, well, I'll just take just one minute. No. <laughs> the, the oldest one, Jared, uh, independent guy. Uh, <laughs> and when he made his, up his mind, it was made up. And he, I remember he was a super football player in ninth grade. And we're driving home from the banquet, and he got this big award. And he says, and I'm done. I says, you're done with what? He says, I'm done with football. I said, okay. What are you, all I said was, what are you going to do? Not, don't explain yeah. it. And he says, I'll let you know. And he became from this husky guy to the slim guy as a terrific cross-country runner. And then all of a sudden, he announces in 11th grade, he says, I want to go into music. I went, music? Okay. You know, and... He is a band director in Harper Creek Schools, extremely successful. He's been written up all over the place. Great. And uh, obviously, we're very proud of him. His other brother, I always called him Mr. St. Clair because he was perfect, you know, everything, academics. He was, you know, athlete of the year at St. Clair High School. He could do no wrong until he went away to school. Then he, uh, you know, he was enlightened to life and uh, a whiz at math. He's a math teacher in Utica schools. Uh, both of them met their wives at Western, and so uh, their wives are Broncos also. My daughter, <laughs> oh, she, I don't want to be like my brothers. <laughs> she, she still doesn't, she's hilarious, but uh, I am not going to Western. Well, fine, we don't really want you to go there if you don't want to. So she starts looking around and she says, I don't know what I want to do. I says, what do you like to do? So I really like working with little kids because she worked at the pool and she taught the little kids how to swim. So maybe you want to do something with early childhood. So she's looking around, looking around, and I says, you did look at Western, didn't you? She says, why would I do that? She says, I've been there. I says, no, you've been to a football game there. Mm -hmm. So she went to Western. <laughs> and so we're all Broncos. And uh, she actually was a teacher with these China schools when she started. And she uh, works uh, for the, with the government program in Portland Schools with four-year-olds, and okay. she loves it. And uh, they said they are on their mother's side, sixth-generation teachers. <laughs> Amazing. It is. I said all their brains came from mom. I said, <laughs> and all that determination and stubbornness came from dad. <laughs> now, Tony, your dad lived till he was in his 90s, wasn't he? My father was 97. 97. All right. Well, that's good because Excellent. we won't wait to 100, but when we bring you in here for your 90th birthday, because <laughs> you're obviously going to have one with these Greek genes, what do you want people to remember Tony Cavus for? What would I like to be remembered for? I think as someone who uh, was a good guy, friendly to everybody, and a caring individual. Well, I think that, it, to sum it up without rattling on forever, I, uh, I care about people uh, intensely and uh, care about what happens to them. I uh, was in Greece this summer, my, my first cousin, she still lives in the village, she doesn't speak English. She's 87 years old. I care about her. Mm. I, I care about our village. I care about our house there. I mean, yeah. we, have, we have a house, we have the house where my father was born. My sons, I mean, their, their eyes welled up. I mean, that night, I'll tell you, we were, in, we were out in this, one of these alley restaurants toasting Grandpa that night. And uh, I care about family. And I think I'll be remembered for that because I really do care Those about are, my family. That's great. And for our listeners at home, when I first talked to Tony about possibly uh, coming on and having a <laughs> conversation, he says, what in the heck are we going to talk about for more than five or ten minutes? You can see that Tony uh, has done a lot in his life. We've heard some great stories that a lot of our listening audience may not be aware of, of 
what Port Huron looked like in the 50s and 60s, the role of those Catholic schools, uh, the Cavus grills that you, we have all grown up knowing in, in the connection, the Greek heritage, the family, the teaching, uh, what you meant to your students at Marine City High, especially as a uh, uh, senior sponsor and yearbook advisor, that uh, on behalf of uh, Channel 6 and WatchCTV.org, Tony, thanks a lot for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. I've had a great time, Sam. Thanks. And if you uh, in our listening audience uh, know of someone who might be an interesting guest on this show, just go to our website, watchctv.org, drop us a line. And uh, on behalf of the station, thanks, Tony, for coming. Thank you. You've been watching Conversations with Tom Shorkey. Conversations explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live through the eyes of interesting individuals. If you have an idea for a future conversation, please contact us at www.watchctv.org. Thanks for watching Conversations with Tom Shorty.